So our final speaker today is um, Maria Accente. Um, in her role as AI program driver and AI for Good lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, she's closely involved in advising organizations and institutions about the use of AI systems in, in a wide range of applications. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers' most recent CEO survey found that 85% of CEOs believe that AI will significantly change the way we do business in the next five years. Um, and the responsible AI toolkit that Maria and her team has developed is a suite of customizable frameworks, tools, and processes that have been designed to help individuals and companies harness the power of AI and help in an ethical and responsible manner. Um, since we're focusing today on the social impact of AI, it's entirely appropriate that you're here to um, share your, your wisdom with us. So thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you very much, and lovely to be here, and uh, what a great day. I mean, I, I, I took so many notes, I don't remember when I took so many notes, so thank you for having me. Hopefully, my presentation will be a little bit different. Obviously, I'm the last speaker, so... Um, Hopefully you're not going to fall asleep. I have to make a disclaimer. I'm fluent in PowerPoint. Then, hence, uh, the end of the presentation, everyone feels that um, I've had some casualties that by PowerPoint. Please excuse me. <laughs> the reason I have slides is that ultimately I will share those slides, and you'll be able to to you know dig deep uh, into the the. the the topics of my presentation obviously get a glimpse of what happens in the enterprise world, where the magic happens. And when I say enterprise, I'm stepping up, putting the tech companies aside. We're not a tech company, we're a professional services company. Maybe we heard about us being providing audit and accounting services. Um, but what happens in companies like ours or NHSs or, or TFL or uh, retail companies when they talk about AI, when they consider developing AI? And I think um, I will probably start with, with something that I find extremely relevant because we are not the technology companies. We look at AI with different lenses. We look at the AI embedded in, in the current context, being in uh, organizations, being in enterprises that deliver value or non-for-profit or, or, or government. So we look at AI through the perspective of the context and we try to evaluate how a technology as potent as, as AI will not just transform the way we are a society by disrupt. And believe me, our clients like transformation because transformation means optimizing the status quo. Uh, they don't like disruption, but they know it's coming because we have some companies like Amazon or Apple or Google, they have set the bar extremely high. They have changed business models. And most of our clients, most of the private sector would look up to those companies and their current business model because of various reasons. So when we look at the um, AI as, as a disruptor of transformative force, we actually run, of course, some studies to understand the size of it. And yes, um, you might question the figures, which are less important in this case, but what is important that shows AI is going to have significant impact on our economy. And we look mainly at the value that AI is going to create, both by um, increasing productivity in a current uh, value chain, but also um, boosting um, consumption. And as I said, the, 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 the figures are less important. What is important, the size. And with that size, the fact that the opportunity is enormous, comes a risk, and also a huge responsibility who, who, for whomever is looking to tap into those those opportunities and those figures were so shocking to uh, some of our decision makers being in the government or the c-suite then everyone was started rushing um, into developing their own plans a strategies or national AI strategies and and it's really interesting to see how ai has now captured the attention of governments around the world um, not just the politician but also the government because uh, they've seen that besides the potential to boost um, economies, it can actually be used of, um, as a way to capture, I would say, more momentum at the stage, uh, at the international stage. And this is just a very small snapshot of the current and the most mature AI national strategies. Obviously, we have ours. It's not, call, it's not called a national strategy, but it's AI sector deal. Um, and uh, follow through, we have Germany, uh, 
not so much USA China that came from a different direction with a different mindset by allocating uh, a huge resources to address uh, AI adoption, uh, not just the China level, but globally at scale. Uh, but also we have uh, countries like Japan, where technology has been part of their society forever. And for them, uh, AI is not as extraordinary because they've been, used, they've been living with this type of technology for a long time. To UAE, who made the big statement of uh, bringing all of us as experts from around the world uh, to discuss uh, how should we govern AI. So everyone from government level to organization are trying to find their feet and looking at AI with strategic lenses, not just operation and not just technology, but how can we unlock value? Probably the one besides UK, um, the, one of the most interesting um, developments in terms of AI as a strategic initiatives it happens at European level and EU, and with the uh, the the um, GDPR is probably the best sh chance we have into making sense of AI and and getting the opportunities um, unlocked, but but also protecting us against um, possible risks is. Um, the fact that the European Union ha now has made their um, uh, or regulating AI as their strategic priority. And I'm, I'm going to read you something that I find really interesting for a politician to say so loud. Um, it will be the job of the next commission to deliver something so that we have regulations similar to general data protection regulation that makes it clear that artificial intelligence serves humanity. And I quote um, Angela Merkel. And with that in mind, the new um, president uh, of the uh, European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, has made a, 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 her, her very strong mission that in her first 100 days in the office, she will put forward the legislation for coordinated European approach on the human and ethical implication of artificial intelligence. For me, that's like a, 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 an extremely positive message uh, not just for you guys, because you've been researching those issues as someone is paying attention and someone who has um, the authority to draw regulation. And so those regulations ultimately come and help us as industry level to govern artificial intelligence in all the domains. Going back to uh, the, the area that I know best, which is business and supply chain and value chain. So you see it at uh, enterprise level, uh, AI is now spreading a little bit like wildfire, but in a good way, because there are uh, amazing opportunities to use um, various technology within AI across the value chain, from uh, understanding new markets and new customer groups, from personalizing um, uh, uh, new products and enhanced experience, all the way to uh, one of the favorite parts of businesses, which is supply chain. And if you wonder why Amazon is or are as big as they are, is that uh, 25 years ago, Bezos has a dream and his dream of what was about optimizing supply chain. It's pretty much the story behind Inditex and Zara, who acknowledged that a fully integrated automated supply chain will ensure the expansion or generating value as they did. When the, 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 the public focus on AI um, started to, to, to be in, in uh, main media, um, the C-suite and the decision makers started to pay attention. And of course, since we are that, uh, uh, I would say, layering between what happens in society, the new, the new trends and what keeps our CEOs and C-suite um, uh, awake at night, um, we conducted some interviews and, and a series of uh, some studies with uh, our CEOs ac across the world. And Marcos is saying, um, we interview the CEOs just to, to kind of map or to understand how much do they understand of what AI is. Most of them being non-technology people, most of them being business executives. And how do they, how confident they are they can find a place for the for AI to start flourishing within the enterprise. 
it wasn't not to our surprise the fact that the vast majority recognized there is uh, uh, the potential of AI. Also, the fact there there are some risks associated. But which is probably a bit more surprising for the rest of the world is just only six percent have AI implemented at scale. What it means that the rest. Um, the projects are still in proof of concepts. They will be more likely in center of excellence like we have, uh, or in, uh, in IT departments or innovation centers, but they are still proof of concepts. And from proof of concept to actually wide scale implementation is a long journey. So even if you look at the cost associated with that, you more or less spend 25% of a, of, a, of a cost developing on machine learning solution on the POC, right? The rest of 70% means scaling it up, making it work in the current complex enterprise architecture. They have their own problem we're not going to discuss today. Again, in the context of the enterprise, because of the hype of uh, AI in the last two years and starting with Davos two, two, two and a half years ago and the constant um, narratives in the press about the dangers of AI mainly, and most of the executives will say, okay, I'm allocating budget, I'm going to hire the best data scientists, let's just go and do it. I want you to build me some reinforcement learning solutions. Do you even know what it is, what it does? No. How far are you on this journey? Have no idea. So the reason I, I thought that it, it's really interesting to have this slide is this, this is helps client position themselves on a scale of maturity to understand that AI is a technology that has evolved and is based on previous technologies. And even if you want to kind of climb that, 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 that um, scale or, or if you want to progress on the journey, you have to have the right building blocks in place. You can't really jump into machine learning if you're still traditional programming just because you learn this is, has a lot of potential and I want to build it. So I'm just going to give you everything you need. There's a journey. You have to make your organization ready. You have to assess what you have internally and build on top of it. Opportunities, fine. Everyone understands that everyone is ready in the enterprise sector uh, to go and do it, to allocate resources, but also um, an acknowledgement that AI triggers a series of risks. And while some of the industries like financial services due to their, their current regulations are, I would say, used to um, identify and manage risks, um, uh, uh, others are more likely to do it. And we're not talking about existential risk here. We're talking about different type of risk, the ones that manifest as a result of implementation of the solution at enterprise level, could be security related performance, of course, or control, uh, but also um, macro uh, risk or um, society level. And those particular ones are the ones that, if managed right, um, could trigger huge changes and produce positive outcomes. But in the same time, the biggest problem our clients um, uh, seems to be having it first of acknowledging is where is my accountability lies with economical risk or um, ethical risk, right? So if I operate in a society where um, due to my industry, um, some lines of business are prone for automation and I, I go full stream and automate all those jobs. If my competitors will do the same, aggregated will generate a societal problem. Where is our responsibility? How much of this automation has to go forward before I create a, a social problem? And how much of this is the responsibility of the government or who, who, who else's responsibility is? But those type of risks um, are on the mind of our executives. Uh, they were acknowledged, but I think um, where groups like, like yours in the conversation like today and many other forums help shape that, that narrative and bring the conversation from existential risk to something that's much more important now and much more of a risk. And what's the response to um, this huge opportunity that AI can generate but also the risk is what we call responsible AI. And obviously, um, Marcus has mentioned that we've developed a toolkit, but it's 
much more than a toolkit. It's about the framework, a way of approaching the development of the responsible AI that taps into the opportunity, balancing the risks, in the same time provides that agility that will allow us to deal with unintended consequences. Um, and we come with scratching our heads how to describe responsible AI, not make it necessary a, um, a, a new so brand or tagging into a, a, a group of services or products, because it should be wider than that. I think the way we've approached it, we say that responsible AI is a, a type of development of AI that looks at um, having deliver upon the promises, meaning I have a solution that it, it, it does what it says on the team, but in the same time, I'm able to maximize those benefits in the current context. And yes, I've, I've, uh, through the course of today, um, a lot of very, very interesting uh, conversation about challenging the status quo. But in order for us to challenge the status quo, especially um, someone who is in charge of managing those big systems, either yeah, the, uh, governmental departments or um, businesses like our clients, they're not very open to have that huge uh, the, uh, 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 disruption because potentially that might be the end of that system. And then we have too many cases in the business world where the slightest um, butterfly had a tremendous effect on, on businesses. So I think there's business, business executives are much more cautious in playing with that, how much we can disrupt current um, uh, structures before it will break. But there is that room to be considered as long as the current system is to a certain extent safe and is still be able to deliver not just because of the um, uh, shareholder benefits or whomever uh, manages or owns that business, it's because of a dependency of companies like this and the role they have in society. The fact that they employ a um, uh, uh, large number of people, but also the role they play in society. And obviously, um, developing uh, artificial intelligence is both robust and beneficial has wide implication not just for us uh, coming from uh, the business field but also for regulation also from the academia what i thought is really important is not necessarily um the the topic is the fact we need to to be more honest and more transparent about collaboration and, and bringing it all together if if throughout you know let's say the, the last few years uh, regu uh, regulatory bodies and businesses are much more interlinked and um, have this dialogue. I think where we have to push ourselves a little bit more is bringing academia as, uh, as long and being equal part of, of dialogue. And because at the moment is, it feels that the thinking happens in academia and by the time uh, the businesses sit down and plan their future, plan the development of those applications, a lot of the consideration are not being seriously embedded in their thinking. Um, and if, to a certain extent, the, the robust AI, um, it's well covered, where I think this type of dialogue is, is, um, is important, is exactly about around beneficial AI. And the fact that the, the businesses now are paying close attention to um, the scrutiny uh, Facebook has, the scrutiny Google has, and the fact that um, now Google, uh, Google has been the top employer in the technology for, I don't know, 10 years. It was a, um, uh, a good strategy uh, to invest massively in creating that um, image as a top employer around the world, providing benefits, providing um, making Google an appealing uh, place to work. Uh, with what has happened in the last two years alone, not just with Google, but also with Facebook, has actually started um, pointing attention that perhaps that was more of a PR exercise. Perhaps Google is not that magical place where, uh, where people um, step into Nirvana and they have the best amazing experience. And I know probably it's a, it's a small process, but um, 
people start to question corporation much more than um, they, they used to do before and question not just the corporation themselves, but the narratives that are coming from those corporations. I mean, if you think about um, how, how much effort uh, uh, the social media have, have put into PR campaign um, with the last events and how much of a backlash that narrative has received from uh, this, uh, the society in general. The fact that people do take with a lot of pinch of salt what, uh, what Zuckerberg is saying. And I think it's with, with events like this, um, many of the companies and the executives acknowledge they can't, they can't play that game. I'm gonna close the doors and I'm gonna do whatever I want and I'm gonna uh, serve you a, a nice uh, PR narrative and um, that's the end of the game. I think there is a call for higher transparency, not just in um, how um, AI is being built, but how AI is being operated, how companies uh, make decisions around AIs. And I think that's quite, I would say, encouraging. Um, and it's not coming from necessarily from the CEOs, from the C-suite, it's coming from the society, from all of you guys. I mean, the fact that you start with a, with a, a, a post on Twitter or an article and that create actually a storm um, and draw attention uh, to that particular topic. When we look at um, developing uh, an AI that's both beneficial and robust, um, we do what consultants do best, create frameworks. Frameworks are, to a certain extent, useful because it allows you to achieve whatever objectives you have set up. You set the direction, you have a roadmap, and then you go and achieve it. The reason I think our approach is, is or our thinking, which is not new, is based on a lot of research and a lot of consultation with our partners across academia, think tanks, um, and um, uh, uh, government is the fact that we are not focusing only on um, data and algorithms. We, we focus on the implication of AI uh, at the entity level. And the fact that we know that um, ethics will not deliver upon the promise if it's not considered as a strategic initiative. We, AI is not going to magically become fair if we focus our attention on the biasing data and models, if we still have silent and uh, unseen biasing processes in norm and culture. Hence, we have to start with a stop. We have to start with an honest acknowledgement that uh, in order to embed, in, embed values in autonomous systems, we need to understand what values, whose values, and how applicable are in certain contexts. Um, more likely, uh, for example, in most of the application we develop for our clients in business to business, fairness is not applicable because we're talking about business to business type of application. More likely, interpretability or security, it's extremely relevant. But the secret source of our thinking is not in um, embedding necessary ethics or, or having a hands-on approach around uh, the three domains of performance and security, I would say that the secret source is around governance. And um, the, the, I would say the essence of the governance module is the most basic project management you can have. We all know that in order for you to be successful in any domain, you have to manage different tasks, uh, uh, disruption and be able to adapt but keep things under control and this is why having a hands-on control on on your AI it's extremely important and not just relying that you'll be regulated or you'll be scrutinized by different groups is for you to be able to understand how far AI goes where do you start controlling and when you when you stop controlling if, if you stop at all A lot of the conversation I said around AI, governance of AI, um, uh, embedding ethics in AI happens at the model level. And um, we had been thinking, how do we then integrate those 
uh, those conversations at the, the wider context. And the fact that when you develop any type of technology, um, there is a certain process, a certain life cycle that, that's been there forever. So back in the days when you consider building or implementing a large scale or uh, enterprise um, application, you'll start with the business case to understand what is the problem you're trying to solve. And that starts before you even start considering what solution you're gonna, gonna develop, develop. I think this is where we are fighting a little bit um, against the culture that comes from technology or tech industry that traditionally for the, for the last 20, 30 years have been um, building solution and trying to overfit the problems to those solutions. We're trying to change a little bit the focus and say, you have to understand what you're trying to solve before allocating resources, before determining if you want, if you need machine learning or the most basic of data analytics. The beauty of this picture that says a thousand worlds is that allows a lot of people who are not data scientists or are not executive to understand there is a journey where they can fit in. The fact that if you are part of the procurement function, which at the moment is one of the most underlooked um, uh, groups in the story of AI. A lot of the uh, technology of AI, it's not necessarily developed in the house, it's acquired. And the, uh, uh, the ones signing the contract at the moment are flying blind. We're talking about procurement professionals, uh, uh, legal experts, and it's very hard for them to understand all the complexity there is. But I think it's by, by seeing their role on this map, they understand that there is a, a need for us to start working together, for them to, to get the level of education and awareness, but also for us to open ourselves to understand um, how to best integrate those concerns with the current processes and, and, and structure. Which leads me to the last part of my presentation. Um, what do we do? How, how do we move things along? How do we go beyond um, um, consultation and ideas uh, to action, knowing that action is probably the most com complex task, um, especially in the face of AI? I would say that we need to start acknowledging that there is a high degree of complexity in our lives. More, with, with the developments of technologies and science in, in, in the last hundreds of years, our society has become extremely complex system. Um, no one is willing to, to fully understand, uh, not the United Nations, not the world leaders, not anyone. And with that in mind, whenever we need, we want to um, tackle that diversity, change it, update it, we need to start breaking down in, in, in bits and bobs and see what are the parts of the system we need to have in place? How do they need to change or update in order for, for that value to be realized? An enterprise level, when we talk about AI, and I, I mentioned earlier the fact that a lot of our clients um, have um, various solution um, of AI in proof of concept. When they, they intend to move towards scale, they'll have to look at various building blocks um, of scaling that up. And those building blocks are massive. We're talking about structure of the organization. Um, we're talking about um, the workforce. Do we have the right people that have um, the right level of expertise, both technical and non-technical, to be able to deal with that scaling up? But also we have a big elephant in the room, monetization, right? When, when um, AI is being discussed in the enterprise, it always has a, a price tag attached to it, right? So if those the, the promises are not being realized, we could potentially see a little bit of a backlash. I wouldn't say an AI winter. That the, I don't think that's possible from what we speak up from the enterprise, but the willingness to invest in, in solution, it, it's, it's limited. We also have to, to think of how do we integrate those technology with others like blockchain, IoT, um, and all the other new technology, because ultimately, from a value creation perspective, it's not the technology that's important. It's how do I align that technology with what I'm trying to solve. Also, more likely, it's, um, lately, it's data. Um, probably is not a big surprise for a lot of you, but um, data is a messy story in enterprise, uh, especially in 
in, in companies that are more than 20 years old, uh, Google, Facebooks of the world. And that provides with a, with a huge challenge into how do we bring that data together? How do we make it AI ready? A lot of this data is dormant in databases that no one, not even the, uh, the CDOs or CIOs are aware of. Um, and that data needs to be processed to be able to unlock um, the potential of AI. But we also need to challenge ourselves in the way we think about AI. And the fact that disrupt transformation or optimizing the current status quo, it's something that business executives will mostly desire, but I know the disruption is coming. And the reason I think that this is an important point we need to be making more often is that um, if you read Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalist, that Johnny was mentioning earlier, she described the business model Google has created and a business model that it's opaque. It's, it has been sheltered and hidden for the rest of the world for many years. And all she did, she opened the lid and said, this is how Google is making money with your data, our data. And it's not just how they make money with our data, it's the architecture they created behind. The fact that they have the benefit of, and I'm trying to quote um, Shoshana, um, large scale automated real time architecture. That means that a lot of the processes happen at Google are large scale automated processes. It's, it's the same thing that happens in Amazon Amazon is a different type of business. And, but um, with the value they managed to generate um, in such short period of time, I think about all those companies are less than 20 years old and they are now um, the, 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 the most valuable um, companies in the world. The rest of the companies, the laggards, are catching up. And while we're busy um, trying to catch up, they are co constantly changing the rules of the game without us even being aware. So I think we need to start thinking, how do we navigate how it's those, this new type of society, the AI is, it looks more likely it's going to create in a way that we invent new tools because we're navigating towards um, new shores. And at the moment, we're still trying to navigate with the same tools we've done before, which I think it's not, it's not, it's not um, suitable. And lastly, um, something that I've, um, I've heard being mentioned uh, throughout the day and the group itself, I think it's probably one of the best example. We, we need to have that honesty about collaboration and it's not for the sake of us coming together in a room. It's about paying attention and being partners in dialogue. And it's not just about different parts of society. It's a call for us organizations, right? So. Um, we are calling for diversity. We are calling for diversity of, of uh, thought, uh, diversity of um, opinion, but are we ready to foster that and making it work? And that's the challenge we have at the moment, right? We are bringing people in the same room, but we are not that now sure how to work with that feedback, how to make it or action upon it. It's not just enough to consult with your stakeholders when you're trying to set up or understand what are the ethical principles that are more relevant for your organization. It's important to be able to show progress, that their feedback, you know, it's not just being considered, in, you know, uh, added into report, we action upon it. And with that with mine, I, we do have time for 10 minutes of questions, if I haven't bored everyone so far. <laughs>